Up until two weeks ago, it was nearly impossible to create something like this maze puzzle box in Fusion 360. While other creators were sharing their excitement about finally being able to wrap text around a curved surface, I realized the new emboss feature opens up way more opportunity than that. We can now wrap sketches, SVG files, and just about any design around a curved surface. Let's take a look at how to create your very own maze puzzle box. Also, just a quick heads up, this tutorial assumes you have a basic working knowledge of Fusion. That will help keep the focus on the project and the emboss tool. To start, we'll create a new component for each part. The first one will be for the maze, and the second one will be for the cap. With the maze component active, we'll create a new sketch on the bottom origin plane. We're going to create a cylinder that we'll use to wrap the maze around. With the center circle command, I'll start at the origin point and I'll make the diameter 30 millimeters. Now a lot of the size is up to you, but I'll discuss some key dimensions in a minute. I'm going to extrude the circle at a distance of 70 millimeters. Before creating the maze, we'll want to shell the cylinder, making it hollow. If we try to do it later, the shell command will mess up the maze. With the shell command active, I'll select the top of the cylinder and I'll define the thickness as 2.4 millimeters. Again, this dimension can be whatever you desire. I'm using 2.4 millimeters as that's easily divisible by my wall line thickness that I have set in Cura. The last thing that we want to do is create an offset construction plane. This is to ensure our sketch is in front of the surface. We'll select the front XC origin plane, and all that matters is that it's in front of our cylinder. We'll use this construction plane for the maze sketch. We can then right click on the plane and create a sketch. With the emboss command, you'll find that bodies cannot intersect one another. Otherwise, you'll get an error and Fusion won't compute it. To help avoid this, we can create a construction rectangle, which we'll use as a reference. I'll activate the two-point rectangle. We'll set the height to the same as our cylinder, or in my case, 70 millimeters. For the width, we want this to be the circumference of the cylinder. The great thing about Fusion 360 is that we can type functions within the dimension inputs. If you recall, we define the diameter as 30 millimeters. For our equation, we can use the radius of 15 millimeters or half the diameter. Our circumference is two times with the asterisk symbol. Then what most don't know is you can use pi by simply typing out the capital letters P and I. We then need to multiply that by our radius of 15. That will give us the circumference of the cylinder. Before clicking to place the rectangle, let's hit the construction option in the sketch palette. We've now defined the max area we can use to sketch. Anything outside this box will not be able to wrap around the cylinder. At this point, we have a choice to make. One option would be to use Fusion 360's native sketch geometry to manually sketch out the entire maze. It's certainly possible, but it's likely going to take a fair amount of time. Instead, I found this online maze generator. Just be sure to read their licensing as this cannot be used for commercial use unless you purchase a commercial license. A link to this and everything else mentioned in this tutorial can be found on this tutorial's resource page. You'll have to adjust the size based on how large you're making your model, keeping in mind that we can also scale it in Fusion 360. The cool thing about this generator is that we can check the solution option. This lets us hit generate and we can then preview the maze. You can then continue to generate options until you find a maze that you like. This allows us to choose how hard the puzzle box is to open. Lastly, we have to get this into Fusion 360, so we'll use the SVG option. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphic. 
In short, it's a common graphic file extension, and Fusion 360 can recognize it and turn it into native sketch geometry. The only problem is that we need to thicken the maze lines so they're wide enough to extrude. Now you could do this by offsetting each line in Fusion 360, but again, that's going to take a fair amount of time. Instead, I opened up the SVG in Adobe Illustrator and simply changed the stroke weight. I then expanded the pass and used the Unite option to join them together. To be clear, you don't need Illustrator. This can be done with Inkscape or really any other graphic program, including several free web-based programs. As always, you can also follow along by downloading my file from the resource page. Back in Fusion 360, we can go to the Insert dropdown and we'll activate the Insert SVG option. We'll select the SVG from our local computer. At this point, we can scale the SVG, making sure it fits within our box. Now I'm going to intentionally make it larger than the box to show you what happens. I'll activate the Emboss command from the Create dropdown of the Solid tab. With Emboss, we need to select all the sketch profiles, and then we can select the cylinder for the faces. You'll see that I get an error message. Again, this is because Fusion can't compute the bodies if they self-intersect. I'm going to undo so I can reinsert the SVG. This time, I'll scale the SVG to 1.433. Now this is simply the largest number that I found this would scale to while still fitting within the box. Another thing I learned while experimenting with the emboss feature is that you have to be careful when you're close to the top or bottom edge of a body. If you're too close to the edge, Fusion may give you an error because it doesn't know where to place the sketch. To avoid this, I'm going to move the SVG to the middle. I'll move it up 3 millimeters and click OK. Once again, I'll activate the emboss feature and I'll select both profiles. This time, as I select the face, you'll see that it wraps nicely around the cylinder. We no longer have to do the time-consuming workaround with the sheet metal tools. The amazing thing about this is that we can adjust the position of the emboss without having to move or edit the sketch. We can move the position with the arrows or the dialog. We can also switch this to a deboss by selecting that in the dialog. Notice how it cuts into the cylinder. Let's leave this set to emboss at a distance of 2 millimeters and click OK. Look at how easy that was to wrap this maze design around the cylinder. At this point, we need to add chamfers to all of the edges, ensuring they can be 3D printed. Let's first clean up the top. With the extrude command, we can select the inner profile. Using the two object extent type, we can select the outer face. This will cut away the excess, leaving us with a flush surface. With the chamfer command, we'll have to select all the outer edges that make up the maze. You can use selection filters to help with the selection. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip ahead to where they're all selected. Within the chamfer dialog, we'll want to set the chamfer type to distance and angle. You'll want to set the degree to 45 degrees, which leaves us with a nice overhang that can print without supports. For the distance, you'll want to set this to 1.5 millimeters or whatever aligns with your extrude distance. Once that is complete, we can proceed by making the base of the maze. We'll then create the cap that has a notch on it. I'll create a new sketch on the bottom face. You can create any base shape you'd like, but I recommend a polygon, which makes it easier to hold and twist. I'll sketch a circumscribed polygon with a radius of 20 millimeters. At the very end of this project, we're going to put an indicator near the opening. That will make it easier to understand where the notch is and where the maze ends. To have a surface area for the indicator, we'll want to rotate the polygon. 
Now we can shift click a vertex and the center point before adding a horizontal constraint. This will ensure that our flat surface area aligns with the cutout. With the solid extrude command, we can extrude this in two directions. This will allow us to go to the bottom surface using the two object extent type. I want my base to be about 10 millimeters thick, so I'll then go 7 millimeters in the other direction while making sure this body joins the existing body. Just be sure to select the inner circle as well as the outer polygon. Once that is complete, we're ready to work on the cap. We'll add fillets at the very end. Let's go ahead and activate the cap component. We need to copy over the base shape so we can use that as the foundation of our cap. Let's use the project command to project the edges of the top face. This leads us to the most critical point. We need to factor in clearance so the cap will fit over the maze portion. The cap should only have the notch at one spot so we cannot offset the existing geometry. Instead, I'll draw a new center circle and I'll place it larger than the projected circle. That will allow us to dimension the distance between the two, which we'll set as our clearance. I did several test prints and found 0.5 millimeters to be the perfect clearance for this maze box. Of course, you may have to tweak this based on your print settings and your printer's tolerances. We can now extrude this up to the top of the maze component, once again using the two object extend type. We can also change the start option to from object, which will allow us to define an offset distance of 0.5 millimeters, factoring in a small clearance at the bottom. Let's create a new sketch on the top face and we can extrude both the outer and inner portion, finishing off the top. I made mine a thickness of 2 millimeters. We're now ready for the most important part. We have to create a notch within the cap which forces the user to navigate the maze. We need to locate the opening at the bottom of the maze as we want the notch to be positioned here when the cap is fully closed. There are several ways that you could do this, but I'm going to sketch on the bottom of the cap and we'll simply offset the notch to the correct position. We need to sketch out a triangle with a minimum clearance of 0.4 millimeters. We also have to make sure it's not too small or the notch will simply slide over the top of the maze. I'm going to start with the construction line in the middle, and because I have the auto project feature on in my preferences, you'll see that it projected the curved edge. With the line tool, I'll simply sketch out half of the triangle shape and we can dimension it afterward. We'll have to create a sketch point to reference with the dimension. That will allow us to dimension from the point to the bottom line where we can use the 0.4 millimeter clearance. We want the triangle to mimic our chamfered edges, so I'll add a degree dimension of 140 degrees between these two lines. To follow the best practice of fully defining sketches, I'll add the remaining dimensions. Now the bottom line will be 0.5 millimeters. The angled line will be 4 millimeters. And the top line can be whatever it defaults to. We can then mirror this over to the other side using the sketch mirror command. 
Hiding the maze component will allow us to select these two profiles with the extrude command. The position is really important, so we'll need to look at the maze. For now, let's extrude this to a distance of 5 millimeters and click OK. We'll want to lower the cap opacity to 50%, which will let us see how things are positioned. I want the notch to line up with the first maze area and to be away from the edge a bit, so I'll edit the extrude. We can then change the start type and set the offset to negative 2.5 millimeters. Now you may have to adjust this according to your maze pattern. Once that is complete, we can hide the maze component. We'll use the chamfer tool to ensure the edges don't run into the maze walls. Again, we'll want to set the degree to 45 degrees, ensuring this will print well. We can then define the distance as 1.5 millimeters. All that matters is that this fits within the chamfered shape of the maze. Now we can turn the maze component back on and double check. Since that looks good, I'll turn the opacity back to 100%. There are two last things we'll do to finish off the model. Let's first fillet all the outer edges so they're not sharp, and then we'll create an arrow indicator for the notch. With the top component active, I'll fillet all the vertical edges to 3 millimeters. We can then add a new selection and select all the top and bottom edges. Using the faces will help us select everything quicker. For these edges, I'll add a fillet of 1mm, ensuring they're not sharp. Now you may have to hide the components to select areas where the two parts come together. We want to avoid selecting any of the maze or inner workings. With the cap on, there's no easy way to see where the notch is, so let's activate the component and create a new sketch on the front face. This is where you can get creative and put any shape or indicator. I'm simply going to create a 5 by 6 millimeter triangle, and I'll extrude cut it away at 1 millimeter. I've repeated the same on the other side and added a 1mm chamfer to ensure that this prints well. The last thing I recommend is to use the interference command. This will help you double check that the cap body doesn't collide with the maze body. If that's clear, then you're ready to print them out. Simply right click on the components to save them as STL files and send them to your chosen slicing software. Thanks for making it to the end of this tutorial. I want to give a quick shout out to all the new patrons and supporters who have joined in the last two weeks. If you've learned anything with my tutorials, then consider supporting me on Patreon or buy me a coffee as it helps me get things like this camera and other stuff to make the tutorials even better. Last but not least, subscribe if you haven't already, and then watch some more tutorials on 3D printable projects.